it's a whoop. Yep, that, yeah, there's no speaker. No, la mienne est allumée, mais there's no one here. Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. It's an honor to be here with you today. Oh, noisy crowd. Good afternoon, everyone. It's a pleasure to be here with you today. I'm thrilled to introduce um, Tom Arnold, the chair of the stakeholder group for Food Vision 2030, Ireland's agri-food industry strategy lead, and our keynote speaker today. Uh, Tom's was Ireland's special envoy for food systems 2021 to 2022. He chaired Ireland's 2030 agri-food strategy committee, which produced the food vision for 2030. Uh, Ireland's National Agri-Food Strategy to 2030. And for the EU Commission, he chaired the High-Level Expert Group for Food Systems and Science and the Task Force on Rural Africa. He was a member of the Champions Group Network for the Food Systems Summit, and his previous roles include serving as the coordinator for the Scaling Up Nutrition Movement, uh, a position I now gleefully occupy. He was also Director General Institute of the International and European Affairs and Chair of the Irish Constitutional Convention and the CEO for Concern Worldwide. Uh, Chief Economist and Assistant Secretary General of Part Irish Department of Agriculture and Chair of the OECD Committee for Agriculture um, and an Administrator at the e AU Commission. So I'm delighted to have Tom here with us as the keynote speaker. Um, today's session, we are also joined by my co-chair and moderator, um, Mr. Kusan Kusani Ajubani, who's Minister of State of, and Minister for Agriculture and Rural Development of Côte d'Ivoire. I'll be introducing him a little later. But let me start, since we're somewhat behind, um, given the plenary session upstairs, to give Tom the floor. Uh, to ask him to give the keynote, and then I will move to introduce the, the other uh, panelists who are in the audience. So, Tom, over to you. Thank you very much, Afsan, and for that introduction. Um, effectively, what I did as chair of this National Agri-Food Strategy Group in Ireland was to try to chart, to use the language that we all are used to, chart our national pathway for food systems transformation. And I'm going to try and draw some lessons that we took from that process, um, some of which may be relevant to the experience of other countries. I'm not suggesting that we have found a blueprint, uh, but I think some of the things we have found should be considered by other countries embarking on their own national pathways. I'll very briefly tell you what the outcome of our process was. Uh, we had a stakeholder committee of 32 members, which were representative of all the major sectors of the agri-food system. This was the fifth such process since to develop a strategy in Ireland since 2000. So that represents an important institutional capital, and I'm very conscious that other countries will not be starting with that advantage. Uh, we, it took us from January 2020 to August 2021 to finalise our strategy. Uh, that obviously included the COVID time, so that didn't help. But uh, we reached a draft report in April of 2021, which was then put out for public consultation. And it was on the basis of that public consultation that the document was, was then finalised and approved by the government in 20, August 2021. At the very beginning, we made a decision we were going to adopt a food systems approach uh, to our strategy. In other words, we were going to acknowledge from the beginning the important interconnections between agri-food policy and the environment, between agri-food policy and nutrition and health. They were the key things that, in an Irish context, were relevant to developing a, a, an agri-food strategy. We came up with what we called four main missions. 
which really were the high-level policy directions that were at the heart of our, our strategy. Number one was to deal with agriculture and the environment. One, number two was farmer welfare and income. Number three was the whole area of food, how to increase the value added and sustainability of food production. And number four was the whole area of technical innovation. The areas which I believe were of real inno innovative nature for this strategy by comparison to any of the other, er uh, other earlier strategies was a commitment that uh, A, obviously built on a food, food vision, food systems strategy approach, but secondly, that there should be coherence between our domestic food policy and our, what we will, uh, our international foreign policy on, on, on food systems. So that our commitment to sustainable food systems and the wish to become a leader in sustainable food systems should express itself both domestically and in international conferences such as this one. Now, I want to try, draw what I think are relevant lessons from uh, our side, and I'm saying this is not a blueprint, but it's our experience and I think merits consideration by other people embarking on national pathways. I have 10. They're not the 10 commandments, but they may be the 10 suggestions. Number one, be very realistic about your starting point. Understand the nature of your agri-food system and the key challenges and opportunities it faces. A second dimension of realism is realism about the political economy you're working within. Because if you're framing a policy which, or a strategy which you hope is going to have traction, you need to take into account the, you know, the reali political realities you're dealing with. Number two, take time and care to try to get the right people on the stakeholder committee. That really is crucially important. People who have the capacity ultimately to represent their viewpoint, but also have the capacity to compromise. Remember that arriving at a conclusion is going to be dependent on the chemistry in a group, so you need people who are aware of that. Number three, we found that laying down ground rules for the operation of the committee was of critical importance. I proposed a set of six principles that we would base our work on. They were things, in a, in a way, simple things, like the principle of trust, the principle of collegiality, the idea that we were going to be, have good, open, robust con 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 discussions, but they were going to be confidential to the committee. And so we were trying to build a confidence already that we were not going to have leaks from the committee, which would be ultimately de destabilizing. That worked very well. So I would repeat, laying down ground rules for such an exercise, I think, is important. Number four, a framework that defined sustainability with its three dimensions of economic, environmental, and social sustainability. That gives a sufficient flexibility and overall framework to enable, make easier ultimate compromises. Because, you know, if, if somebody doesn't get what they want in some areas, there is perhaps potential to get it in others. Number five, acknowledge that food system transformation is difficult. It's going to require people and institutions to talk to each other and collaborate with each other who, who frequently are not used to doing that. So this question of time, being in, in, in needing to invest time in, 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 in these relationships is of critical importance. And it also needs to make sure that we recognize that in any strategy, you need to have both short-term achievables, medium-term achievables, and things that can only be achieved in the long term. Number six, deadlines are useful. There, obviously, there should be an, an overall deadline for the task, but there should also be interim deadlines along the way. And it's important as you do that to build a narrative which is going to begin to frame and solidify as you get through your work. And there is, a, I think, a critically important role for the chair in this regard. Number seven, don't let the best be the enemy of the good. There need, if you're going to arrive at a, a final strategy, there has to be a spirit of compromise, and you know that people have to realise that you know a final strategy re requires that. Number eight, you won't achieve everything in your strategy. 
there, there, there was a very good example of this in the Irish case. We knew that we had to come up with convincing uh, strategies to deal with the links between agriculture and the environment. And this is very tricky in many countries now, the division that there is between, let's call them agriculturalists and environmentalists. So that relationship needs to be invested upon. But about, some, about a year after we published our report, in which there were already clear targets, uh, the government took a set of other decisions about climate, which requires that, the, the, if you like, the, 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 the bar was significantly raised. So there had to be some additional discussions in additional groups to deal with that issue. Number nine, I think it's important to look, to link a national strategy to the wider international dimension. This is why this meeting here today is important. Uh, we will have to assess how two years on from many important commitments made by government, how far governments have got to. So I think it's, it's a useful benchmarking and it's also a useful learning possibility. And number 10, important to lay down in any strategy, monitoring arrangements and implementation so oversight, which really can be, uh, which are really necessary. Because the credibility of a strategy uh, and the future and future strategies is going to be determined by what has been achieved by the one that you've just done. So there, if you like, my suggestions for consideration for many of you who will be embarking on your own national pathways for food system transformation. I hope they are relevant or at least worthy of consideration. I thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Tom, and thank you for being so clear on how to address some of the large and persistent inequalities across the food systems chain um, and what steps are needed for the kind of transformation uh, to make that possible at the country level. As you know, uh, in the Sun Movement, uh, since its inception in 2010, we fer focused very much on uh, collaborative entities fostered by the Sun Secretariat, the Sun Business Network, Sun Civil Society, Sun Donor Network, and UN Nutrition that I see is, is very much in the room. And these organizations respect, uh, representing the type of stakeholders that you've talked about at the national level are the driving force behind that change. So I'm very pleased now that we're going to have a bit more of an interactive session and uh, I have a couple of questions that are, are going to be, uh, I'm going to ask, and then I'll have specific speakers in the audience that I'm going to, to put these to. And then uh, the Honorable uh, Minister, I'll give him the floor to make a brief intervention and he'll moderate a further discussion. We thought this way we'd get a better sense of interaction uh, rather than just speaking from here. So the first question I have, um, I, I, is a question that I'll pose to three panelists. I'll, I'll ask each of them to come in. But it's how to support effective integration of food systems transformation with other global agendas and reconciliate stakeholders' divergent interests. And this is key to some of the discussion we've been having already throughout the day. But I'd very much like to invite uh, Philip Linbury, who's the CEO of Compassion and World Farming. He's the Global Chief Executive Officer uh, of the Farmed Animal Welfare Organization. He's visiting professor at the University of Winchester in the UK and president of the Brussels-based umbrella body of nearly 100 leading farm uh, animal welfare um, societies in Europe, Eurogroup for Animals, and is the founding board member of the World Federation for Am Animals, a global membership organization to represent the animal protection movement at the intergovernmental level. He's also a leading uh, leadership fellow at St. George's House, Windsor Castle, and fellow of the Oxford Center for Animal Ethics. He was um, uh, appointed as UN ambassadorial champion for the 2021 uh, Food Systems Summit in New York, and was appointed co-lead of the Sun Summit's Sustainable Livestock Solutions Cluster. So let me put that con uh, question to you, if I may, please, uh, Philip. And uh, once you've given your answer, I'll turn to the next panelist. Thank you so much. 
Madam Chair, thank you so much for your very kind and generous introduction and for having me here. And as you rightly said, I was, uh, I'm proud to have been a, uh, an ambassadorial champion for the 2021 uh, Food Systems Summit and uh, delighted to be here at this stop take to see the wonderful work uh, that the UN governments and stakeholders across the world have been uh, doing over the past two years. And I think it's, it's pertinent to reflect on the fact that we're gathering in, uh, in Rome, a sweltering Rome, where uh, heat wave records are falling at a rate of knots. And it reminds us that climate change is real. Uh, at this summit, we've also been reminded that the, 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 the food sector is the biggest single contributor to greenhouse gases, to the use of fresh water, to the use of land on the planet. It is central, therefore, food is central to the solution to those multiple crises that we face of climate, of biodiversity loss, nitrogen pollution, and food security that threaten to ravage our world. Without addressing food, achieving the SDGs will be beyond us and climate change will beat us. The choice now facing humanity is, I believe, extinction or regeneration. It is hugely heartening then to hear from Antonio Guterres, the UN Secretary General, reaffirming his call to action to transform food systems to end the senseless war on our planet. And I believe that key to ending that senseless war is recognizing the principle, the beautiful principle of one health, that the health of people everywhere relies on the well-being of animals and a thriving environment. To fulfill that, I believe we need to consider moving away with urgency from industrial animal agriculture, keeping animals in cages and crates that undermines their well-being causes great pollution, undermines uh, nutrition uh, and food security in the future. I believe the Food Systems Summit is uniquely placed to take forward a transformational agenda. It has brought transformation of the food system into our lexicon. Now we need to look at the what, transformation to what and how. And I believe that creating the space for all perspectives to be expressed is important, with touch points being ambition, urgency, kindness, and respect. What's at stake is the future for all of us. What's at stake is that if we don't get this right, if we don't change the food system with the urgency required, then those who will be harmed most will be family farmers, the disempowered, the marginalized, those suffering poverty, vulnerable communities, and animals, both domestic and wild. Important that we get this right, Madam Chair. Thank you so much for all you're doing to take this agenda forward to true transformation of the food system. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Philip Lindbury. I'll now try to pass to Diane Holdorf um, <coughs> with the same question of how to uh, support effective integration of food uh, systems transformation with other global agendas and conciliate stakeholders' divergent interests. Uh, Diane uh, Holdoff is Executive Vice President and member of the Senior Management Team at the World Business Council for S Sustainable Development based in Geneva. Um, and uh, she has also, before joining that, been Vice President and Chief Sustainability Officer at Kellogg. I'm thrilled to have you here, Diane. Let me pass the floor to you. Thank you. Thank you so much for welcoming me here today. It is really rewarding to be back in Rome two years after such a successful pre-summit for the UN Food System Summit that then took place in September of 2021. And I think it's fair to say that that was a true milestone moment for the food system. It brought the different government ministries together, the different stakeholders across the food system together, and for the first time, really raised the agenda of what it takes to action a successful outcome for our food systems going forward. And Tom, you said in your opening comments here, it continues to be a complex space. 
there's many, many challenges that we have to overcome. But as Philip, who spoke just before me, said, if we don't put food systems at the heart of these transformations, we won't actually solve the urgent crises of climate, biodiversity loss, and equity. So important to keep that at the center. I'm really pleased to be able to be here today to represent the voice of business, but most importantly, ambitious business. Because there's quite a lot that was mobilized into the Food System Summit in 2021 that continues today. And I want to touch on that because small and medium business, as well as global multinational businesses, sit truly at the heart of how we succeed in what we have to drive forward in partnership with others for the food system. We know that we had a very successful business declaration for food system transformation, where over 220 CEOs from businesses of all sizes around the world signed on to declare action to support that transformation. We are working today with the World Benchmarking Alliance to publish before the end of this year where we've seen progress and where challenges remain. Inevitably, it will be both, and it will continue to show us what we need to focus on going forward. One of the other things that I think that the Food System Summit did in 2021, which we see coming into this stock take, is put food systems onto the global agenda of the other UN action areas. In Montreal, the CBD Pro, uh, COP15 held food systems in the global biodiversity framework as part of the action and the investment that needs to be mobilized. And we know with the Her Excellency Mario Malmeri speaking now in the plenary, that the COP28 is also bringing food and agricultural systems into the heart of the climate agenda. This allows us to continue to drive these actions forward in a way that really integrates the outcomes that we have to see in order to be successful. It's through these multi-stakeholder and multi-UN um, processes and governmental processes where we really can drive the types of outcomes that it will take between these different stakeholders. We are going to continue to contribute to and lead on the ambitious agenda. Not only will we see what comes of the stock take declaration by the end of this year, we'll also help to lift an aggregation and an accelerator for a private sector is investing and must do more for regenerative outcomes. This will be launched as part of the COP28's food systems uh, commitments, but it will be an action agenda into COP30 in Brazil because we know that regenerative outcomes at the farm level take time and they take investment. It's not a one-off commitment action moment. So we'll be able to announce what that looks like and how we mobilize and accelerate from there, keeping equity at the center of how we measure outcomes for success for farmers. We see other events and actions such as Regen 10, which is also putting these types of KPIs and outcomes into the public domain for aligning stakeholder outcomes behind what will be successful for farmers, agricultural communities, the governments who need that success on which they depend for food security, and the drivers that business must take forward in order to achieve it. So we're here to continue to demonstrate success ambition, and the types of commitment to outcomes that we all depend upon. We look forward to seeing what progress we'll have made further by the time we come back for our next stock take. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Diane. Um, I'm now... I'm now going to turn to uh, Rocco Rinaldi, who's the Secretary General of International Food and Beverage uh, Association. Uh, he's been Secretary General since 2013. In this role, he oversees the management of all aspects of the organization, leads the development of its positions and commitments, and is the main interface of the alliance with its stakeholders. Um, first and foremost, the United Nations system, international civil society, and private sector partners. So with that, Rocco, let me turn to you for the same question I've asked uh, Diane and Philip. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you, Chair. Thank you. Thank you for the opportunity to take part in this roundtable on behalf of the, of the members of IFPA, which are some of the most prominent names in, um, in the food and beverage industry internationally. Let me tackle briefly the first part of the question, how to support effective integration of food systems transformation with other global agendas. The question is very relevant because obviously, as we've heard many times already, the food, food systems have a major impact uh, on many of the SDGs. I'm not going to enumerate them, but suffice to say that 
an estimated 80% of, of, uh, of deforestation is due to agriculture and a third of anthropogenic GHG. Despite all of this, integration into the global SDG agenda of the food systems agenda has been slow and patchy at best. If you look at climate change and agriculture day was included at COP27 last year, and it's only actually this year that uh, we're going to see a declaration probably on food systems, agriculture and climate action, which should secure the place of food systems on the climate agenda and the COP process going forward. But this integration does need to be accelerated. If you look at biodiversity, uh, if it's true that between 50 and 70 percent of biodiversity loss is due to agriculture, then uh, there should be a much more integrated biodiversity agenda under the UN uh, Convention uh, on Biodiversity, um, which so far includes the same target on food waste as is already in the SDGs, but it kind of stops there. That said, Mainstreaming the food systems agenda into the global multilateral agenda is, I think, only part of the answer. Because we know, and we've heard it from the Secretary General and others many times already, we are not going to meet the SDGs by 2030. Of 140 SDG targets, only 15% are, are on track. On 30%, there's no movement or we're going backward, and um, SDG uh, 2, Zero Hunger, is one of them. So, Integration of the food systems agenda into what is unfortunately a struggling overall global SDG agenda is only a part of the answer. What matters more is probably a stronger policy integration and coherence at the national level. And on this, I find the UN Secretary General's report to this summit relatively encouraging. It highlights, for example, that since 21, 126 countries have adopted national pathways and 155 have appointed food systems national conveners. Improved policy coherence uh, is on the agenda. Uh, and the UN Food Systems Summit of 21 has also spurred several countries to develop food security and nutrition strategies for the first time. So efforts at integration uh, are extending beyond agriculture and food security and nutrition. So, for example, to include social policy, equity, and education, at least in some countries. And these are, I think, interesting national examples to follow. Um, and it's at this level that the Secretary General's progress report provides another encouraging insight, I think, which moves us onto the second part of your question, which is how to reconcile stakeholders' divergent interests. The progress report, in fact, also indicates that 70% of countries are making efforts to establish or strengthen food systems governance to facilitate cross-sector collaboration and multi-stakeholder engagement. Several countries are taking steps to establish and strengthen interdepartmental mechanisms for coordinated action with a mandate to facilitate the integration of policies, strategies, and actions from various sectors. And building on the momentum of the 625 national dialogues that were convened ahead of the 21 summit, many countries are continuing to foster engagement with stakeholders. The pursuit of this inclusive agenda is going to be essential to reconcile any divergent interests along the food value chain. And I think the absolutely critical link here is farmers. Because we cannot simply ask farmers to produce as much, if not more, on the same land, if not less, with less inputs, at the same price. Farmers are not able to absorb the cost of internalizing those major externalities of agriculture that we are familiar with. Even in rich countries that have agricultural subsidies in place, this is a challenge. These subsidies can be reoriented towards greening agriculture, and if you look at the European agricultural policy, that is a case in point. But even there, it's not straightforward, as we can see with the current backlash against the Green Deal and the Farm to Fork strategy, which is effectively pitching, to a degree, farmers against the rest of the food chain, which is actively calling for these greening measures. That challenge is even greater in lower and middle income countries where farmers effectively have to compete on world markets without subsidy. A depressing fact is that even though food systems account for a very significant proportion of uh, employment, farmers are some of the poorest people and the most food insecure. 
And we can't just say it's a matter of paying more for our food. As we've seen over the last two years, a bout of food inflation causes food insecurity, even in the richest countries in the world. So food system transformation isn't difficult, mostly because divergent interests among different stakeholders in the systems, but because there are major and complex trade-offs and e economic implications that go beyond the food systems as such. So, in the private sector, there's plenty of action taking place. All IFPA members, like WBCSD members, are investing in going carbon neutral by 2050, in going zero deforestation, in eliminating impacts, including in scope three. All are investing in regenerative agriculture and a private sector COP30 action agenda on this is in the making. None of this is possible with, without numerous and diverse partnerships among food systems, actors and beyond. This is still the least developed dimension, public-private partnerships. They are encouraging progress signs in this area, but a major acceleration is needed. And it is only governments that can unlock it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Rocco. With that, and, and hearing from three very um, important constituents and stakeholders from with different perspectives, let me now turn to my co-chair and moderator, um, the Minister of State in Agriculture and Rural Development in Côte d'Ivoire, uh, Mr. Kobinan uh, Kusai Adjumani. He's going to, before being appointed Minister of State uh, for Agriculture and Rural Development, he was in charge of the Ministry of a Animal and Hellenutic Resources um, as well. So I think links very well with the earlier points made with Philip. I'll give him briefly the floor and then we'll, I'll open up the floor to any further questions. Merci, Madame la Modératrice. C'est un honneur pour mon pays, la Côte d'Ivoire, de co-présider et de modérer cette table ronde des parties prenantes. Je voudrais profiter de l'occasion pour transmettre les salutations et félicitations de Son Excellence M. Alassane Ouattara, président de la République de Côte d'Ivoire, que j'ai l'honneur de représenter à cette rencontre de haut niveau. Mes félicitations au secrétaire général de l'ONU, au Centre de coordination des systèmes alimentaires de l'ONU, principal organisateur de cette table ronde, et dire combien nous sommes heureux d'être ici. Revenant au sujet du jour et à la question, Mesdames et Messieurs, pour une transformation durable du système alimentaire, il nous faut évidemment, comme cela a été défini tout à l'heure, définir clairement ensemble les objectifs. C'est un exercice souvent difficile puisque à cause de nos intérêts nous nous heurtons souvent à des points de vue divergents. La première question de cette table ronde renvoie à la manière dont nous pouvons intégrer les agendas mondiaux et concilier les intérêts divergents des parties prenantes tout en poursuivant dans l'effort les engagements pris dans le cadre de la résilience de nos systèmes alimentaires. Je voudrais donc féliciter les intervenants qui nous ont édifiés sur la question et vous prier de bien vouloir les acclamer. Merci. J'aimerais à présent avec la permission de Madame la Présidente, passer la parole à l'assistance pour vos analyses et suggestions. Thank you. So if there are any further questions or comments from the floor, now is the time. Please, sir, go ahead. Thank you, Madam Chair. 
My name is Ratan Nal. I'm professor of soil science at Ohio State. I was very pleased when the comment was made that we want zero emission agriculture. I would like to suggest, take a very careful look at that. For example, if one hectare would take one metric ton of carbon for planting, harvesting, irrigation, fertilizer, etc., are you saying we need to sequester only one ton produce in agriculture to make it neutral? Think again. Agriculture has a lot more potential. We can produce, I hope, 10, 15 ton per hectare of biomass, 40% of which is carbon. If it was the machinery, electronic, farm equipment, etc., I can understand zero emission. For agriculture, it has to be much more aspirational goal than that. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is an important opportunity to hear from as many uh, diverse stakeholders and partners, uh, particularly if you have uh, suggestions or experience from your own national pathways. So please. Please, go ahead. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Charlie Wellington with Consumers International, representing uh, more than 200 consumer groups in over 100 countries worldwide. Um, I think the experience from our member organizations of engaging in pathways and other kind of such processes is that there's often a tendency for consumer groups who have less of a focus on food. They work on food, but also on energy, on finance, across so many areas. Um, they don't have the same capacity to, to actively bring these issues to government, to force themselves into the room. Um, and so, there's a gap, I think, between uh, inclusivity as openness to all and inclusivity as genuinely creating space, encouraging those right voices into the room, creating a space in a, in a context that often aren't easily navigable uh, for, for kind of civil society groups with a limited capacity. Um, so it would be a call to, to governments, to uh, conveners, to all those uh, organising these processes to actively think about how to bring consumer voices in uh, as a key component of, of food systems change. Um, and also to other stakeholders to, to look more to consumer groups as allies, um, the, to kind of build together uh, with, with producers, um, with kind of workers throughout the food system, with youth, with women. There are strong, obviously all of these groups are consumers as well. Um, and by, by strengthening those alliances with communities um, across these countries and across the world, uh, there's really strong potential there that I think is easy to miss, but important to, to keep on the agenda. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for flagging those key points. I see a gentleman at the left in the back. Please go ahead. Ismi Fadi Jabir, Amin Am Tahad Al Arab Al Sanaat Al Ghadai. I ask only, what will be available to the consumer in the five years to come for the farmers and the small farmers to start to produce and to learn and to practice? ماذا سوف نستهلك؟ إذا استمر النظم الغذائية بما فيه فالكرة الأرضية لن تكفي لإطعام هذه الشعوب. شكرا لكم. Thank you very much for that very grounding question. I don't see. Ah, please go ahead. Yeah. Thank you. Um, my name is Yuri Olila. I'm the uh, convener for Finland. Um, <clears throat> uh, in my country, we have a, a rather well-established system of uh, consultation and uh, consultation uh, with, uh, with uh, various stakeholders in, in various policy matters. And uh, when putting uh, together this pathway document, uh, I was asking myself uh, many times, do we have all the, the relevant partners in our discussion? And there is one uh, group uh, I finally did not get a satisfactory answer. Um, namely, if we, we do, uh, we, we must uh, look uh, uh, towards the future and not towards the, uh, the uh, past. Um, and um, I have the feeling that uh, 
there is happening and will be happening soon a, a similar development that has been uh, uh, we have seen in the field of uh, uh, of uh, information and communication technology with all Googles and uh, Facebooks and so on. Uh, in the food sector, we have uh, new kinds of new business models, uh, new delivery systems, uh, beginning from those, you all know these uh, young men on, on bicycle with a box in, the, in their back. Uh, but I mean uh, new ways to, to uh, uh, choose your, 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 your uh, food and your diet, it is uh, more and more combined with dietary uh, consumer patterns, um, new kinds of marketing, direct sales directly, not only directly from local producers, but globally direct uh, 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 produce flows. Uh, that is something which actors in those new fields do not even think themselves to be part of food system. They are in, uh, startup uh, businesses, and, uh, but they will be influential, uh, revolution, revolutionary influential in, 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 uh, rather soon, I, 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 I think. So we should be very uh, active in trying to get a grip of that new phenomenon which will decide a, 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 an important part of, of, uh, of the future food systems. Thank you. Thank you very much. In, in terms of some of the broadening of the stakeholders, please go ahead. Namaste, my name is Kailash Kaur Chauhan. I am from Dungarpur Jilde. I have been working in the service of the service and I work in the service of the और मैं ये कहना चाहती हूँ कि जब अब कोई नीति बनाते अब चुनौती लगाते हैं तो उसमें छोटे बड़े किसानों को साथ में लेके नीति चुननी चाहिए क्योंकि कई बार ऐसा होता है कि छोटे किसान रह जाते हैं और बड़े किसान नो ट्रांसलेट नमस्ते माय नेम इज मानसी शाह एंड आई एम कैलाश मैन इज टॉकिंग इन हिंदी आई कुड ट्रांसलेट फॉर हर वन शी इज डन सो इसमें ये होता है कि किसान जब अपन नीति बनाते हैं तो उसमें क्या बड़े किसानों ज़्यादा करके आगे आते हैं और छोटे किसान रह जाते हैं तो जब अपन नीति बनाते हैं उसमें छोटे किसानों को भी साथ में लेके नीति बनानी चाहिए और जब कैसी सी अपन देते हैं तो छोटे और बड़े किसानों को समानता देनी चाहिए uh, yeah, sorry. So her name is uh, Kailash Kaur Ben from Rajasthan, Dungarpur district in Rajasthan, India. She herself is a small and marginal farmer and has a land holding of about uh, uh, two acres. And she says that she wants to uh, add here that when the national pathways are being framed for the food systems, uh, it is important to have the views of the small and marginal farmers also, uh, because most of the policies that are being framed are kept uh, framed keeping in mind large farmers. Uh, whereas in India there is a large sector of farmers which are very small and marginal and uh, the type of documentations required for the policies um, are unavailable with the small farmers. So it is very important to include the small farmers in the design and implementation of national pathways and policies. Thank you. Thank you so much for raising that very important point on, on national consultation processes and inclusion and equity that's also been raised by, by others before. I think it's a critical element. So what I'm going to do now in the interest of time is pass straight to uh, the second uh, set of questions, um, really because we're, we're, we started a little late. So I just want to... Uh, I'll do, use the same format. The question is how to address failing food systems negative consequences on social groups, such as power imbalances, social exclusion, and inequity. And it follows very well um, based on the last statement that was just made. Um, for that, for the first question, I'm going to turn to, uh, for the second question, for the first speaker, I'm going to turn to uh, Gladys Virginia Luciano. Uh, is a climate and food systems youth leader currently serving as network uh, engagement manager at Young Professionals for Agriculture, 
where she works and supports the meaningful engagement of young people in the field of food and agriculture across 60 countries. Um, so I'm very pleased to have Gladys with us and uh, to listen again to the youth voice. It's a very important component of moving forward on the food systems transformation and youth have been leading on, on much of the climate debate. So linking this to the food systems transformation is essential. Please Gladys, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. Um, it is a pleasure to be here today and to provide a youth perspective to this question. Um, it's interesting because the way that the question is framed implies that um, a failing food system leads to power imbalance, to inequity and social exclusion. When in reality, it is because power imbalances and inequality and social exclusion exist that we have a failing food system. Um, we often forget that our food system is a man-made design. It's made by people. Um, and it currently serves the purpose it was designed for, for better or for worse. Now, because I'm a young person, I also have to be optimistic. And so the good news is that we have the ability to envision and redesign the system together, putting the needs of people first, which then leads me to the second point. Our failing food system is a reflection of a failing economic system that prioritizes profit above the needs of the most vulnerable, which again is created by the system itself. This includes youth, this includes farmers, indigenous peoples, and women. We're not doing enough uh, to put the needs of right holders first. As we're in the process of envisioning and redesigning the future of food systems, we need to have an understanding of what a radical transformation entails because this is what we need. In the words of Ms. Davis, radical simply means grasping things at the root. And so to grasp at the roots of food systems, we must question our economic system and policies that are not serving people, planet, or animals. Short-term initiatives that we engage in are necessary to provide relief uh, to those that the system have made vulnerable. However, in parallel, we must continue to work towards a collective vision in which we're all able to thrive. As young people, we have a lot at stake when it comes to food systems transformation, but we do have a lot to gain. And so we are committed to working towards a collective uh, vision in which no one is left behind, in which all species can thrive, and in which no one is made vulnerable due to an unjust system. Thank you. Thank you very much, Gladys. So I'd again like to put the same question, and please reframe it if you think uh, it needs to be reframed, as Gladys just did. Um, but uh, to Jeffrey Roth. Jeffrey Roth is the vice chair of the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues. He has over 23 years of experience advocating for American Indian, Alaskan Native, and global Indigenous rights. Mr. Roth currently acts as the uh, Coquille Indian Tribes Health and Executive Board Chairman. And likewise, he's an advisor and volunteer assisting tribal, urban Indian, and Indigenous in the United States and Latin America. So over to you, Jeffrey. Thank you. Uh, you know, I'm honored to participate in this stakeholders roundtable to discuss the negative consequences of the failing food system on indigenous peoples and the inequity and social exclusions resulting from the mainstream food systems created by colonial institutions and replicated by current governments. I'd like to frame this intervention under two instruments. First, the Indigenous Peoples Wapala, or White Paper, provides strong evidence that indigenous food systems and practices enhance the sustainability and management of healthy food, protect biodiversity, support food safety, and are intrinsically and positively related to land use, social dynamics, and spirituality. I appreciate the World Food Program's acknowledgement and advocacy of this in the pre-session um, press conference. Second, the recently released UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues, Indigenous Determinants of Health Study, provides a comprehensive elaboration on 33 risk and protective factors for indigenous peoples, including indigenous food systems and traditional practices. Indigenous people have known for millennia that a sustainable and nutritional food system entails an equilibrium of natural supply, traditional practices, 
biodiversity, safety, spirituality, economic development, and the interconnectedness of all that exists. Nonetheless, one of the main issues indigenous peoples face is the minoritization of our communities, which occurs in governments and UN processes where we are grouped with other stakeholders, minorities, or vulnerable populations. This creates an invisible indigenous peoples population and thus further exclusion of our people. This is one of the most critical issues facing indigenous peoples in the global food system arena. Indigenous peoples are rights holders under the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. Regardless of these realities, indigenous peoples have been supportive of the UN Food System Summit with the Coalition on Indigenous Peoples Food Systems. We have been working to explain that food system transformation is something indigenous peoples have done for thousands of years. We will work to continue to reach across the coalitions to incorporate our indigenous people's perspective and ensure the work is completed in a culturally specific and respectful way. During the UN Permanent Forum on Indigenous Issues this past April, the forum adopted a study on indigenous determinants of health, which are also linked to our indigenous people's food systems. It is designed as a guide to educate UN agency officials and member states on risk and protective factors impacting our community's health and well-being and provides ready to implement recommendations on each of these determinants of health. It elaborates on protective issues such as traditional and healthy food supplies, their connections to economic and social structures under an uh, intergenerational approach and risk factors including ultra processed food, restricted access to traditional plants, land use and water supply. While the general food system related determinants of health tend to focus on dietary behaviors and nutrient intake, considerably less attention is given to understanding how access to and loss of indigenous people's food knowledge has impacted food security globally. Indigenous people's food systems must be prioritized to preserve balance and complete alignment with the SDGs and achieve the global goals of addressing our failing food systems. I'd like to ask this conference and audience today to assist us in creating the appropriate spaces for indigenous food systems to be at the core and forefront of the global food systems discussion. We can accomplish this through supporting our coalition on indigenous people's food systems and to support the adequate engagement of indigenous leaders across national and UN systems to reduce systematic inequalities and foster the inclusion of our indigenous perspective. I appreciate your attention. Thank you very much, Jeffrey. I'm now going to turn and ask the same question to Ariana uh, Giliordi. Ariana was appointed Secretary General of the World Farmers Association uh, in December 2017. Uh, in this role, she has been strongly promoting solid governments <clears throat> of the association and a wide setup of international partnerships to ensure that farmers can play, fully play their fundamental role in the sustainability changes required. So Ariana, let me turn to you and you have the floor, please. Go ahead. Thank you very much, Madam Chair. Um, I would like to start replying to your question by asking ourselves a, a very simple question. What is a food system? What is this about? And I would love to start with a very simple, if not simplistic definition that a food system is about producing and consuming food, let's say. And so if we look at the people behind it, it should have at the very center of it, the producers and the consumers. So I was very pleased to hear from the consumers representative that they feel they're not enough contributing or consulted or part of this conversation. So are the farmers, the producers, the pastoralists, the herders, the fishers from all over the world. Why am I starting with the definition of food systems to, ask, to answer to your question? Because we should really bear in mind that it's about people here. It's about the family farmers. It's about the livelihoods of women farmers, as, we, as we've heard from the powerful witnesses of um, our uh, Indian representative. And there is so much more. So two years ago, at the UNFSS, 
the producers gathered together, overcoming their own differences and uh, really finding common ground around what is needed. And one of the first answers that was given is that we need to rebalance power in the food value chain. That it's written already out there, it's been two years already. Has it happened? I don't think so, but we see interesting steps in trying to build a new trust around a vision where farmers are not those who have to change or, have, or are causing trouble. No, farmers are those who drive solutions to the challenges we have. I was delighted to hear the youth representative as well. Food systems are not broken. Food systems are answering to a different purpose. And Secretary General reminded us in the plenary that we have to put people in front of the profit. So food systems should serve the people that are producing and consuming food. Is there a way to do it? Yes, for sure there is. And what I would love to uh, uh, highlight in this uh, op um, occasion is that farmers have many solutions. Farmers on the ground in all the regions are coping with climate change, are coping with extreme weather events, are coping with food security issues. And if we really want to find a holistic and systemic answer, we should put farmers at the center of the solutions. Because when a farmer takes a decision on the farm, at the farm level, there's no difference. All the challenges come together. And when we decide what to plant, how to deal with our uh, actions, our activity on the ground, climate change, food security, biodiversity, nutrition, and let me add, human rights, all come together under the same umbrella. So by shifting the perspective and putting those who produce food at the heart, around the table, and co-designing solutions, we might be surprised of the achievements. Thank you. Thank you very much for, for that very compelling statement. I'm going to turn to the third question, because it follows very well what uh, you just asked. And that is to, um, to speak about what are some of the best practices at the country level for the promotion of all stakeholders' part participation and more inclusion in the food uh, systems dialogue? And I'm going to turn to, um, to Mansi Shah for that, because she's been working with SEWA over um, 11 years as a senior technical coordinator in the rural economic and development sector. She's the program manager for the future of work activities at SEWA and um, has been an important member of a, representing a constituency uh, whose voice I think we need to hear far more from. So please, with that, Mansi, let me turn to you. Thank you so much, Madam Chair. And I would also like to thank the organizers for, of this roundtable for giving me this opportunity to represent over 2.5 million poor self-employed women workers from India the members of SEVA. Uh, most of these women whom I'm representing here today, one of whom we already heard, uh, they are all associated with the food systems in some way or other. They are the producers, they work in cleaning, grading, processing, packaging of the food, they are the vendors and the hawkers, they are the cook, the waste recyclers, and uh, even taking decision at household for the household consumption. And uh, in a way, uh, our experience has shown that these women complete the circular economy of the food systems. All these women are economically very active and they contribute immensely to the nation's economy. And yet they do not have any voice or visibility. Neither in uh, their work does not have any validity and they are not consulted in any of the policy dialogues. And therefore to bring voice, visibility and validity to the work of these women and to integrate them at all, le all levels in the food systems and to bring their voices in the food system policy dialogues, Self-Employed Women's Association SEVA has been organizing these women for over five decades now with the twin goals of full employment and self-reliance. And from this experience of organizing these women for over five decades, uh, we have learned 
that to enable inclusion of these most vulnerable stakeholders into the food system policy dialogue, um, organizing is the key. Organizing helps build their collective strength and bargaining power. It helps in increasing the agency of these women workers. It uh, organizing women at national, regional, and global level will enable uh, cross-country knowledge sharing and experience sharing, and it will bring visibility and voice to the workers in the global forums. Secondly, organizing women into their own economic enterprises. It will ensure that women do not just remain workers at the bottom of the value chain, but they become owners and managers of their own value chain. Additionally, we have also seen that women workers engaged in the food system are mostly informal sector women workers who are generally unregistered, putting them outside the purview of the government benefits as well as the policy discussions. Therefore, there is an urgent need for data on these workers. However, uh, when we talk about data, it opens up a completely new Pandora box of challenges related to gender data, such as lack of adequate and correct gender data, and, uh, you know, uh, uh, also um, importance of data amongst the gra grassroots members, issues related to data ownership, privacy of the data, challenges in data collection, analysis, and so on and so forth. And therefore, to address this challenge regarding data for women workers, to bring them visibility, there is a need for partnerships amongst multilateral organizations, government, academia, as well as the private sector. And there is a need for designing and implementing a bottom-up data strategy framework. Such a, data a bottom-up data strategy framework would enable collection of efficient and authentic grassroots data that aligns to the global standards helps in strengthening the basic data collection process and programs at ground, gra uh, ground level. It will help in building the capacity of grassroots women to collect and use the data for evidence-based uh, advocacy and uh, for gender inclusion. And uh, overall, it will help bringing voice, visibility, and validity to the workers in the food systems and help them come into the policy dialogues. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm going to open the floor for five minutes just to get a sense if anyone else would like to make a specific intervention because I'm very cognizant of the fact that part of the last few statements have really been about the importance of inclusion. Um, you have several big thinkers in the room around what kind of transformation is needed uh, in order to g engage more effectively key constituents. So I'll open up the floor for five minutes before I wrap up um, with some key points. So please, go ahead. Yeah, my name is Kagim Maso. I work for the Consortium Group of International Agricultural Research, and I'm in charge of environmental health and biodiversity. Thank you very much for this discussion, really very useful, especially for the understanding of the f uh, food systems and the needed trade-offs that are, are required for things to work. Nutrition, food security, but environment, biodiversity, social inclusion, and so on. When we try to see the different interventions, and I like the last one talking about data, it's really very critical. Where do we have the researchers? in terms of really analyzing the trade-offs. We talk about trade-offs, but I can tell you they are complex to come up with. It's several things, a lot of iteration. I would like to advocate for really also inclusion of a group talking about the science, the research that has to be done in terms of understanding the trade-offs so that we can make the right recommendations. Thank you. Please, go ahead. <coughs> okay, thank you for giving me chance. I am from Bangladesh, Director General, Bangladesh Rice Research Institute. Uh, so, thank you. Uh, I would like to say the projected uh, increase of world population will be 10 billion by 2050, along with the um, consequent requirement of 50% more food production, emphasize the urgent of 
and need to address global security challenges. And we can work together to ensure a food uh, secure future for the ever increasing population uh, of the world by focusing on sustaining agriculture, technological advancement, climate resilient, infrastructure development, investment, and cooperation. Because at the end of the day, uh, we must admit that our first fundamental need is food. Uh, and agriculture continues to be the only source of food. We can create a resilient and inclusive agricultural system that can feed communities and hunger, promote a more sustainable future through our combined efforts, innovation, and commitment. A global perspective on uh, agriculture is necessary to acknowledge the interconnectedness of the food supply. Uh, the challenge is equitable distribution. Uh, if consider global food pr production as a whole, uh, equitable distribution uh, of produced food is fundamental to achieve global food security. While some regions may have surplus food production, others may experience deficit uh, due to various factors such as limited agricultural resources, environmental constraints, or socioeconomic challenges. Uh, by promoting fair and inclusive system uh, for food distribution, uh, we can ensure that all nations, particularly those with limited agricultural capabilities, uh, have access to uh, an adequate and nutritious food supply. Uh, COVID-19 and uh, global conflict especially global conflict, unfortunately, ha have uh, far-reaching consequences that extend beyond their immediate impact of human lives and infrastructure. In regions affected by conflicts, uh, food population and distribution system are often disrupted, leading to a decrease in food availability in the world market. This creates a strain on global food supplies and result is increased uh, food prices, uh, exacerbating the challenges faced by vulnerable population. In addition, uh, the scarcity in foods, notably fertilizers, hampers agricultural productivity and food production. Fertilizers play a crucial role in enhancing crop yields and uh, ensuring optimal plant growth. Thank you. And another, uh, another is, moreover, uh, the rise in the global inflation uh, further and compounds the problem. As the cost of living increases, purchasing power diminishes, making it more difficult for individuals and communities to access the adequate and nutritious food. And the combination of restricted food availability and rising prices poses a significant threat to food security on global scale. Thank so you very much. think globally I'm and act regionally or nationally. Thank, Thank you. you. I'm going to give the last speaker one minute, and then I need to wrap up. The sí. interpreters are stopping at six, so in two minutes. Yeah? So Gracias, sería bastante breve. En Guatemala tuvimos la oportunidad de, actu de actualizar la política nacional de seguridad alimentaria y nutricional. La diferencia de esta política es que no la hicieron un grupo de expertos, sino que fue al revés. Buscamos la información en territorio de pequeños, medianos, grandes productores y eh, creo que el éxito es buscar justamente los objetivos en, en la mayoría de actores del país y esto eh, fomenta la inclusión porque una política debe ser para todos y de todos. Gracias. Thank you very much. I, I think we started the session with some strong points for, from Tom Arnold about bringing key stakeholders together. And when we had this discussion, it was very clear that a multi-stakeholder approach to both food systems transformation and addressing the climate and nutrition elements of, of those food transformations is going to be critical. What was also very clear is that um, one of the most important lessons was better stakeholder engagement, including at the national and the international levels and having voice and agency from those who both determine uh, what we eat, how we eat it, those who consume, uh, and new consumers and, and new producers coming on board, and really to say that we need important transformations in our systems 
to be able to make the food systems people and planet centric and people and planet friendly. There are some important milestones coming up where these discussions will continue, not least the food systems uh, stock take outcome document, but leading into that uh, with the SDG discussions and also um, with COP28 uh, and COP30 forthcoming as the, as the minister uh, mentioned as well. So clearly we, are not, we have seen some acceleration of achievements. Good efforts must continue to extend beyond food to include the social policy and equity agendas and pursuit of that inclusive agenda is essential to, rec uh, to reconcile challenges in the food value chain. Our FAO colleagues are committed as hosts uh, to take this work forward, um, to continue to make sure that there's sufficient space, sufficient dialogue for all the key stakeholders at the international level. And we're very much counting on the leadership of governments, civil society, and key partners at the national level to continue these dialogues so that the food system's pathways are both nutrition and climate sensitive and build on the agenda for the future that's needed to meet the SDGs. So with that, I thank all the participants. I deeply appreciate, I couldn't summarize all the richness of the discussion, but I'm sure my colleagues will have a summary note that would be shared. And we look forward to continuing this dialogue and agenda with you going forward. Thank you so much.